I, as the chairman, have been guided by a simple principle, the principle that the law must deal fairly with every man. For me, this is the oldest principle of democracy. It is this simple but great principle which enables man to live justly and in decency in a free society. It is now almost 15 centuries since the Emperor Justinian, from whose name the word justice is derived, established this principle for the free citizens of Rome. Seven centuries have now passed since the English barons proclaimed the same principle by compelling King John at the point of a sword to accept the great doctrine of Magna Carta, the doctrine that the king, like each of his subjects, was under God and the law. Almost two centuries ago, the founding fathers of the United States reaffirmed and refined this principle so that here all men are under the law and it is only the people who are sovereign. So speaks our Constitution. And it is under our Constitution, the supreme law of our land, that we proceed through the sole power of impeachment. We have reached a moment when we are ready to debate resolutions, whether or not the Committee on the Judiciary should recommend that the House of Representatives adopt articles calling for the impeachment of Richard M. Nixon. Make no mistake about it. This is a turning point, whatever we decide. Our judgment is not concerned with an individual, but with a system of constitutional government. It has been the history and the good fortune of the United States ever since the Founding Fathers that each generation of citizens and their officials have been, within tolerable limits, faithful custodians of the Constitution and of the rule of law. For almost 200 years, every generation of Americans has taken care to preserve our system and the integrity of our institutions against the particular pressures and emergencies to which every time is subject. This committee must now decide a question of the highest constitutional importance. For more than two years, there have been serious allegations by people of good faith and sound intelligence that the President, Richard M. Nixon, has committed grave and systematic violations of the Constitution. Last October, in the belief that such violations had in fact occurred, a number of impeachment resolutions were introduced by members of the House and referred to our committee by the Speaker. On February 6th, the House of Representatives, by a vote of 410 to 4, authorized and directed the Committee on the Judiciary to investigate whether sufficient grounds exist to impeach Richard M. Nixon, President of the United States. The Constitution specifies that the grounds for impeachment shall be not partisan consideration, but evidence of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Since the Constitution vests the sole power of impeachment in the House of Representatives, it falls to the Judiciary Committee to understand even more precisely what high crimes and misdemeanors might mean in terms of the Constitution and the facts before us 
in our time. The Founding Fathers clearly did not mean that a president might be impeached for mistakes, even serious mistakes, which he might commit in the fateful execution of his office. By high crimes and misdemeanors, they meant offenses more definitely incompatible with the Constitution. The Founding Fathers, with their recent experience of monarchy and their determination that government be accountable and lawful, wrote into the Constitution a special oath that the President, and only the President, must take at his inauguration. And in that oath, the President swears that he will take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The Judiciary Committee has for seven months investigated whether or not the President has seriously abused his power in violation of that oath and the public trust embodied in it. We have investigated fully and completely what within our Constitution and traditions would be grounds for impeachment. For the past 10 weeks, we have listened to the presentation of evidence in documentary form, to tape recordings of 19 presidential conversations, and to the testimony of nine witnesses called before the entire committee. We have provided a fair opportunity for the President's counsel to present the views of the President to this committee. We have taken care to preserve the integrity of the process in which we are now engaged. We have deliberated. We have been patient. We have been fair. Now the American people, the House of Representatives, and the Constitution, and the whole history of our republic demand that we make up our mind.